Hello. So now we're going to begin looking at Jeremiah chapter 7 in this lecture. Uh, now, the first part of chapter 7, verses 1 through 15, uh, is commonly referred to as Jeremiah's temple sermon. Uh, the This overall structure of Jeremiah, we've already kind of mentioned this, is... Uh, often kind of perplexing, confusing. It's it's sort of difficult to make a sense of it because it definitely doesn't follow um, a chronological order. And even the thematic, you know, structuring of it is a little bit difficult. It has been suggested, uh, namely by a, a Jeremiah scholar named Louis Stolman, has suggested that the prose sermon actually give us a clue to help us you know, make sense of that structure of the book of Jeremiah, um, because you have, you know, there it's pl the prose sermons, and there's a number of them. Um, they're placed in strategic and strategic spots along the way through the text of Jeremiah um, that help to both clarify what's been said within uh, the poetry, but then also to introduce, you know, themes that are going to be coming up. Uh, I think. That probably is the case here. I think Stolman actually has a really good argument with that. Uh, the first six, or chapters two through six of Jeremiah, as these poetry, this poetry um, with not a whole lot of historical reference, um, it you know it might seem somewhat disjointed at times. And I think the the sermon that we have in chapter seven is uh, it clarifies some of that. Now. Um, Within the book of Jeremiah, most people, and, and I'm of the opinion that Jeremiah, the sermon in chapter 7, is actually a longer form of the same sermon given on the same occasion in chapter 26. Um, I think it's, it's another, the same sermon, uh, just kind of being looked at from a different angle, you know, and, and repeated there. But the longer form here is in chapter 7. Okay. So with that, I want to begin uh, looking through this. Now, if we were, let's see, we start here in Jeremiah 7, uh, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Okay, now let's just look at chapter 26. Um, <clears throat> okay, now if this is the same, this says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, This is what the Lord says, Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah. And you go on from there. Now if this is the same, this actually provides us some valuable data. And that is, this says, this is at the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. Um, here, um, Bereshith, actually, it's the same that's um, the same term that's being used at the beginning of the book of Genesis, in the beginning. Um, so, probably then in the first year. Okay, let me switch back over to Jeremiah 7. Okay, so we're back in the text, Jeremiah 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say. Okay, so now, if this is at the beginning or the first year of the reign of Jehoiakim, we know exactly when that was. That would have been in the year 609. Now, 609 was a very pivotal, monumental year in the history of of uh, Judah at this time. Josiah, who had been king for um, quite some time, beginning in the year uh, 640, so for 31 years he had been king, he was killed in this year. He was killed, if you remember, by the Egyptians when uh, he went out to meet the Egyptians who were passing through the land on their way to f join Assyria. Excuse me. Let me turn off my phone to join Assyria in fighting against the Babylonians. Josiah tries to um, meet them and, and stop them, and he is struck down by the Egyptians, struck down by Pharaoh Necho. Um, so Josiah dies in the year 609. The Assyrians end up being conquered by Babylon in this year. 
the Egyptians, of course, were trying to help the Assyrians. They were not successful in doing so. The Babylonians rapidly dominating the ancient Near East. Their, their kingdom is swiftly expanding. Um, Jehoahaz, who became king following Josiah, if you remember, he was only king for three months. And then the Egyptians, who now had control of the land, including Judah, they exiled Jehoahaz. He had only been king for three months, and they installed Jehoiakim as the new king. So if this is happening in this first year, this, there has been a lot of change, um, you know, as Jehoiakim was set on the throne by Pharaoh Necho. So all of this happens. Um, and then in verse 2, we read, that God is telling Jeremiah to stand at the gate of the Lord's house. That, of course, is the temple. And proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. So, um, you know, this is, this is an indictment of the people who, it says, all who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Um, this term, worship, sorry, I'm trying to highlight, for some reason, not highlighting here. That's okay. You see the word there, worship. Um, this term is literally, it's, it's to prostrate, to bow down. It's a physical act that someone does. This isn't talking about worshiping in terms of like the attitude of your heart. This is more talking about the physical act of worshiping, bowing or kneeling before a sovereign or, in this case, a god. And so the indictment here is against those who um, would perform this outward act of worship, but as we're going to see, they're not following um, all of the covenant stipulations. They're just performing this one outward act of worship. Um, and he says here he's going to ent- um, he's going to go here and he's going to proclaim this word. Uh, those who enter by the gates, we don't really know what gates those those are. Not entirely important um, what gates those are. So continuing on through uh, verse three, this is what the Lord of Armies. The God of Israel says, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you live in this place. When he says, amend your ways, literally he's saying to make good your ways. And now when it talks about ways, um, uh, the word, sorry, I can write this down. The Hebrew word there, sorry. that a little longer, is Derek, D-E-R-E-K, you could spell it like that, Um, Derek. um, This is used literally as a road, but very often it's used metaphorically to describe like the pattern of how you live your life, the the road that your life is on, the the types of decisions, your behaviors, your pattern of living. And he says to make them good, make good your ways. Um, and then he even offers this, and I will let you live in this place. So even here, um, you know, the world is in chaos. Babylon is on the rise. You know, the king has been killed. Another king has been exiled. They've got a new king on the throne. And God is saying, look, exile is coming, but, you know, you can, you can read the signs here. But I'm offering you a way out if you change your ways, if you make them good, um, doing what you're supposed to do. Okay? And now Jeremiah is going to begin confronting here. He says, Do not trust in the deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Okay. Now, whoops. Okay. Okay. When it says these deceptive words, you have to wonder, you know, what exactly he means by saying that these are deceptive words. And then this threefold repetition, why is he saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord? Now, 
Jeremiah is confronting a temple theology that seems to have been very prevalent in his day. See, God had chosen, the people of Israel knew, God had chosen the temple as his dwelling place, the place where he so-called causes his name to dwell. Um, God had chosen that. And so the natural conclusion that many people had is that God, Yahweh, would not allow any harm to come to his temple because that was where he chose his name to dwell. So there was a sense of like, look, it doesn't matter how bad we are because God will never allow anything to happen to his temple. And so here in Jerusalem, God's going to protect that. And there was sort of this um, this confidence that they had. And, and maybe these deceptive words, maybe these are things that people are hearing from priests, you know, that, hey, I know Babylon is, you know, on the rise, but we don't have anything to fear because this is the temple of the Lord. And, you know, we're, we're okay then. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they're hearing that from priests, perhaps from prophets. It seems to have been a prevalent thought, and we even will see that developed even further within this chapter. Now, this threefold repetition you know, why is he repeating this three times? Um, it's a bit unclear. Um, it's probably not, you know, just because, you know, he's he has to sh- say it again because maybe people didn't hear him. There's maybe even perhaps like a, a, a incantation, almost a liturgy that people, I mean, here he is gathered at the temple and maybe people are saying this phrase out loud is almost this sort of like, you know, this this incantation, you know, we have the temple of the Lord, we have the temple of the, you know, that nothing evil is going to happen to us. And Jeremiah is just saying, like, don't trust in, you know, you have this idea that just because the temple's here, that God would never allow, you know, wrongdoing to be punished. Uh, matter of fact, God, as we're going to see, God will, he will, uh, make sure that he does execute justice. Um, so he continues on from here, repeating this this uh, phrase from earlier, verse 5, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, the way you live, the actions, what you do, if you truly practice justice, justice between a person and his neighbor, and continuing in verse 6, if you do not oppress the stranger, the orphan, or the widow, And do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor follow other gods to your own ruin. Then I will let you live in this place and the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Okay, so here he's giving sort of the stipulations. God will let the people continue to live in the land, but here he is. Verse 5, he begins saying, if you truly amend your ways and deeds, if you practice justice between a person and his neighbor, if you do not oppress, you know, all of these things, you know, continuing to live in the land is contingent on all of these things. Um, And a lot of this, this is strongly reflecting uh, Deuteronomic thought. So, um, the connection, the correlations between Jeremiah and the book of Deuteronomy have long been seen. Um, we see some similar um, phraseology being used, similar language being used, uh, definitely similar theology being reflected. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So you have this this idea. You have to amend your ways. You have to make good your ways. Well, in Deuteronomy, you know, we read in in um in Deuteronomy chapter five, verse thirty-three, it says, You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God commanded you. So you're supposed to walk in the way that he commands you. And now Jeremiah is coming along and he's saying, Fix your ways. You know, they're not in the way that God has commanded you, so make good your ways. Make them right. Make them what they're supposed to be. You have this uh, in verse 5, this admonition. You're supposed to practice justice between a person and his neighbor. Um, now, there's a lot of ways that this this plays out. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we read how, you know, at the end of every seven years, 
You know, all debt is supposed to be uh, forgiven. Everyone who has lended to their you know, fellow Israelite, they're supposed to forgive that. Well, here's, here's the question. Is that being practiced? You know, here during the, this time of Jeremiah, are people forgiving debts every seven years the way they're supposed to? Um, similarly, I mean, you have in the Ten Commandments, so Deuteronomy 5, um, verses 20, 21, um, you don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, don't covet your neighbor's wife um, or, you know, desire anything that belongs to him. You know, and working against your neighbor to try to acquire those things. Um, I mean, this is all part of this justice towards between a person and his neighbor that is reflected from the book of Deuteronomy here in Jeremiah. And then in verse 6, I think we've talked about this a little bit before. If you do not oppress the stranger, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor follow... Okay, so this stranger, orphan, and widow. This word stranger is referring to... um, There we go. This is referring to the ger, the 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 non-Israelite who has come to reside amongst the Israelites, um, paired together with orphans and widows. These are three uh, vulnerable members of society, and at the, they're at the heart of God's concern. Uh, we definitely see that number of times in the prophets, and we see it again in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter ten. Verses 17 and 18. Um, here, let me, I'll pull this one up. Deuteronomy 10. Oops. Okay, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, um, and then going through 18. It says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the stranger, that's the gear, by giving him food and clothing. So this is saying the God that you worship, your God, um, he's great, he's awesome, he doesn't show partiality, and he executes justice. So therefore, you're supposed to execute justice. You're supposed to show kindness and provide, protect these people who are otherwise very vulnerable within their society. So let me go back, Jeremiah 7. Okay. Okay. So they need to not oppress them. They need to execute the justice just like God does. Um, And combined with this in, in verse 6, do not shed innocent blood. Of course, this is a, an echoing of, of uh, the commandment, do not murder. You shall not murder. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.17. So when I refer to the Ten Commandments, they of course occur in Exodus chapter 20. They are also repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So Deuteronomy, uh, hopefully you have this, this basic background, but I'll just make sure it's said here. Um, you know, the, the book of Deuteronomy and its literary context, this is when the first generation of, of Israelites who came out from, uh, in the Exodus, who came out from Egypt in slavery, they died in the wilderness. That was God's judgment against them. That's another story. But in Deuteronomy, you have the new generation of Israelites. They're on the, they're on the, um, Sorry, let me think my directions. They're on the east side of the Jordan River, and they're preparing to cross over the Jordan to be able to take the the, the promised land, to invade uh, and conquer the promised land as God was leading Joshua. But Moses now, he's at the end of his life, and before he dies, um, he delivers this sermon, basically. this The book of Deuteronomy, he's teaching the law to this new generation. They were children at the time of Mount Sinai when the law was first received, and so now he's he's teaching it to them. So that's why you have the, the Ten Commandments repeated there. It's a, re, it's a repeating of the law, uh, restructuring it in, a, in some ways. 
And then he says, verse 7, if you do all these things, then I will let you live in this place. So God's, you know, God's promise is if you repent, um, you will receive the, the promise, the, the place that God promised to give to their fathers. You will receive that. You will receive that blessing, this land that was sworn to the people. And this is, again, of course, reflected in the book of, of Deuteronomy. But Jeremiah is going to continue from there, uh, verse 8. So that's kind of the first section. Now he says, verse 8, he says, Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Now we've already seen that, you know, this deceptive word. We saw that earlier, when that threefold repetition, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Those are deceptive words. And now this is saying they're trusting in these deceptive words. Now, this is really interesting. Verse 9, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer sacrifices to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known? Okay, in verse 9 there. Now, when you read that, your mind should immediately be going to um, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. I mean, these are all you know, clear references, you know, you shall not steal, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not swear against, you know, falsely against your name. You know, all these things are there within the Ten Commandments. And this is saying, like, the Ten Commandments is like the heart of of the law. You know, in in ancient Israel, according to to the traditional rabbinic count, there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments um, serves as kind of like a summary. It it focalizes all of these laws and like kind of gets like this is the heart of what it all is, like these Ten Commandments. Um, And then it could even be, you know, we've already mentioned this, you can even distill it down even further just to say love God, love neighbor. Of course, Jesus is the one who, you know, sort of set that out, like this is the summer, like this is everything. You love God, love neighbor. But the Ten Commandments serves as a similar kind of thing. You know, this is the the central idea of all these 600 plus laws. Um, And here it's, you know, basically saying like, look, you've been doing all of these things. And of course, he doesn't list the entire Ten Commandments, um, but the people would have known the entire Ten Commandments, and they maybe would have been running through their mind, you know, have we done those other things too? Like, he doesn't list Sabbath here, but were they breaking? Was that another commandment? Um, I think, you know, rhetorically kind of functions, people are left to kind of think through that process through that themselves um but again it's it's these deceptive words um and now it also says you know these are let's see he says to offer sacrifices to baal and follow other gods that you have not known and i think we've we've talked about this before this word to know yada okay yada is um it's a term very often used to describe a covenant relationship they they have not known these other gods they're not in a covenant relationship with them um so they're walking after gods with which they have no covenant God is the one they're supposed to know. Um, so that's, it's a knowledge, it's not just a knowledge that comes from like an abstract understanding of an idea, but it's a knowledge that comes through a personal relationship, personal experience. That's the, the basic idea of how that's being used there, at least being used in this context. And then, let's see, verse 10, it continues. Okay. So you're going to do all these things and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we are saved so that you may do these abominations. Okay. So, you know, this idea, they're coming and they're standing before God. I mean, this has overtones of, you know, 
like this false submission, you know, this false surrendering. Um, and yet they have the audacity, like in, in a covenant between a suzerain and a vassal, no vassal who has been breaking the covenant stipulations would come and stand before their suzerain knowing that they've been breaking those covenant stipulations. But here Israel has this audacity. They've been, I mean, they've been violating like the core of the covenant. Um, you know, worshiping other gods, oppressing their neighbors, murder, stealing, I mean, all kinds of things. They're violating these, and they have the audacity to come and to stand before with this, you know, this posture of submission, this posture of surrendering, you know, worshiping God there, um, and even having this audacity to, to declare, we're saved, you know, we're delivered, we're here before our God. Um, man, and, and verse 11 kind of continues this, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? And behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. So a den of robbers, like thieves um, would retreat to a cave in the Judean, in the Judean wilderness. There were a lot of caves. And if you know, if you were wanted, if you were a criminal, you could go hide in these caves. Very good chance that you won't be found because there's so many caves. Very difficult to locate someone um, hiding in caves. And thieves would go, they would commit their crimes, and they would go and they would hide in one of these caves and just reemerge at some later time. Now here, God's people are treating his temple like they are a bunch of thieves, and they're going to hide out in a den, just like a, the thieves would go into the cave, and they would, you know, feel safe, like they've escaped, they're hidden now. No, you know, the people who are attacking them won't be able to, you know, trying to uh, pursue them, won't be able to find them. Now the people are committing all of these crimes, and they're going into the temple and thinking, ah, oh, we're safe now. Nothing can get at us. Um, and this is what God is saying, like, you— like, has this house, the temple, which is called by my name, become this den of robbers? And they think that they're hidden, but of course God is saying, I've seen it. I've seen what you've done. I see you. Don't think that you can hide in here and your, your actions, your deeds are going to be hidden. Okay? Now, verse 12, we get to a sort of a new section here. Now he's going to redirect their attention. Okay, he says, verse 12, Now go to my place which was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at the beginning, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. So if you don't recall what why Shiloh was significant, um, this is where consulting a good Bible dictionary can help um, clarify some of these things. Commentary should often allude to it as well. This is how you would do some of that basic research. Um, so where was Shiloh? Of course, this was in the northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel. Um, although this is going back from before the unification. So Shiloh was in the north, but this is going back from before the unification of Israel um, that happened, you know, first under Saul, that all the tribes came together and formed one nation, um, but then more, more significantly under David. Shiloh was the location where the tabernacle was erected at one point. Um, the tabernacle was, was put there. The tabernacle was the tent that was kind of the forerunner to the temple. Now, these people are trusting in the temple that because it's the temple that, you know, nothing bad can harm them and that they can hide in there and be safe, even though they're committing all these atrocities. Well, what, what happened at Shiloh? Um, Shiloh was destroyed around the year 1050. This would have been, um, you know, shortly before uh, Saul became king. Um, just on the cusp of this transition to monarchy. So, 
like if you look at that did did god allow i mean that was the place where his name dwelled the ark of the covenant was there that was the idea was that that was the place of god's special presence within the midst of the people of israel did god spare them no i mean this is kind of an object lesson like see what i did to it because of the wickedness of my people israel god allowed that to be destroyed okay and you might want to think through like how can this um this idea be extended um even today into our present cultural context is there anything um that would make us feel like we are safe we are secure and you know that evil cannot happen to us because because of this idea of a promise um i think jeremiah teaches us that no i mean anyone anyone can um can suffer this similar kind of fate if you are committing these kinds of evil actions okay continuing along verse 13 and now because you have done all these things declares the lord and i spoke to you speaking again and again but you did not listen and i called you but you did not answer so you know god has he's been speaking this you know it says this phrase speaking again and again this is actually a a hebrew idiom um idiom just like a, a figure of speech um like uh you know we would say i'm on the fence that's an english idiom that we that we use it means like i'm trying to make a decision to go one way or the other i have a choice here between two different things i'm on the fence i haven't decided yet that's an example of an idiom when it's translated here um speaking again and again literally it's in hebrew it's rising early and speaking to, to rise early and do something is to do it repeatedly, you know, calling out again and again. This idiom only happens in Jeremiah, um, and it's repeated quite a few times. You'll see this, and it's almost always translated in English, speaking, you know, again and again. I sent my prophets again and again. Um, literally in, in Hebrew, it's this rising early, uh, you know, it's the eagerness to do something. You're doing it with, with passion, with eagerness. Um, like when you're getting ready for a trip and you get up early to go on, you know, to get all ready because you just, you can't wait. It's the idea that you're doing it with passion, with vigor, usually translated again and again. Um, but here now, it's transitioning into this judgment because you have done all these things. Um, and I spoke to you, you know, I warned you repeatedly, but you did not listen. Um, let's see. Okay. And then verse 14, here we have the therefore, okay, I will do to the house which is called by my name and which you trust and to the place which I gave you and your fathers just as I did to Shiloh. You remember what happened to Shiloh? It was destroyed. You know, I did not spare it just because the tabernacle was there. I allowed it to be destroyed. And now God is saying, I'm going to do the same to the house, to the temple, which is called by my name, and which you trust, and to the place, you know, the land, which I gave to your fathers. In verse 15, I will hurl you out of my sight just as I hurled as I have hurled out all your brothers, all the descendants of Ephraim. So now he's saying, okay, your brothers, the descendants of Ephraim, that's a reference to the northern kingdom. And again, 722, the northern kingdom was destroyed. Now Jeremiah is building his argument. He said, you know, you remember what happened to them. I did that to them because of their wickedness, because of their idolatry, because of their, you know, greed, you know, oppressing the poor. And he's saying, look, you're doing the same thing as what they did, and I'm going to treat you just like I treated them. Um, Don't think that you're safe just because, well, the temple is down here, so we're safe. And God's saying, no, I'm, you know, through Jeremiah, saying, no, I'm going to do the same. You're going to become just like them. Um, Ultimately, I mean, you have the the sanctions of the covenant, all the different punishments that can happen, whether it's famine or invasion. The ultimate one is exile. It's this being cast out from the land which God had promised to his people. Literally, um, 
hurled out of his sight is being you know being cast out from the face from from before the presence of god which is very very significant now the temple sermon being concluded there ends in verse 15. I just want to briefly consider the next few verses of chapter 7 in Jeremiah, uh, just because they are pretty interesting and is going to bring up some ideas, some themes that we're going to see play out again later on in chapter 44 of Jeremiah. So now you notice the, the change, the shift that's happened in, in the address here. And it says, verse 16, as for you, Do not pray for this people. So now God is now turning to address Jeremiah directly. This had previously been Jeremiah addressing the people standing there in the temple. Now God is addressing Jeremiah directly. He says, As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them, and do not plead with me, for I am not listening to you. So, I mean, this is taken, you know, quite a turn here. You know, the people of Judah here, they have they stand in a long line of those who have continually rejected God's word. They've, you know, rejected these words of warning. And, you know, should Jeremiah say, you know, say, try to pray on their behalf and ask for God to spare to forgive them, God's saying, look, do not pray for them. So, I mean, this is almost reflecting kind of a and Jeremiah seems to sort of vacillate between these two, like pray, change what you're doing, you know, fix your actions, and repent, so I'll let you live in the land. Like Babylon is coming, but I'll spare you and, you know, let you live in the land. Um, and then sometimes it sounds a little bit more like, you know, things have gotten so bad, you're past the point of no return. Punishment is coming. Now, there still is a sense of repent so that the punishment won't be so bad, but there's a sense that it's an inescapable thing now. And so God's saying, like, look, don't don't try to plead. Don't try to change my mind. I'm not going to listen to that. Um, don't pray for these people. They have had enough warnings. And now he's he's going to explain why. He says, do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? So right there, they're, you know, the temple of the Lord. They're, you know, taking refuge in there. And right there, even within the streets of Jerusalem, and he describes this process. He says, um, this, you know, very public idolatry. It says, verse 18, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make sacrificial cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to provoke me to anger. So there's this, you know, this um, worshiping that's happening of other gods, and it's just open, it's totally in the public, and look how everyone is involved. The children are gathering the wood, the fathers are making the fire, and the women are preparing the cakes. The whole family is in on this um, on this enterprise, uh, just being committed, again, very openly. Um, now, this whole business of making sacrificial cakes uh, for the queen of heaven. Well, first, let's say, who is the queen of heaven? Um, The queen of heaven is, um, you know, it's the goddess of fertility, known by different names, and, you know, depending on on where you are. And they're actually um, connected here. So, um, Astart. Um, that would have been, you know, the name of the Canaanite deity, you know, the goddess of fertility, sometimes um, probably very closely related to, you maybe have heard, Asherah, um, sometimes called, you know, in, um, in a very unorthodox way, referred to as uh, the wife of God. You know, Yahweh's wife would be Asherah, um, and this was, uh, you know, an unorthodox view that some people had that that Yahweh had a wife, and that's who it was. In Babylon, this would have been represented by Ishtar. Ishtar would have been referred to as the queen of heaven. Um, 
probably represented by the planet Venus. Venus was like the symbol, the heavenly symbol of the queen of heaven, so to speak, um, the the morning star. And they would make these cakes. Um, you know, perhaps, I mean, there's a, a few possibilities. Some people have suggested perhaps these were shaped like a star representing, you know, the planet Venus. So these cakes were actually looking like that. There actually have been cake molds. I don't have a picture to show you, um, but there have been cake molds found, um, you know, shaped, you know, you press the dough in or, you know, I'm not sure if you pour, you press the dough in um, and it's shaped like a person and it's very obviously a female person. The idea is that this would have been representing the the goddess of heaven. And so they're making, you know, the the kids gather the wood, the father makes the fire, and then, uh, you know, when the woman would make this sacrificial cake, what they would do is they would place the cake directly on the embers. The basic idea of worship, you know, idolatry, is that when you, um, when you burn something, you're converting it to smoke, basically. You know, the, the object gets burnt up, and you see the smoke rise. And the idea is that smoke is going to heaven and the gods so and broadly within the ancient near east you know when when people would worship the idea was that they were actually feeding the gods the gods you know gods created humans um you know we see this in um and um oh where is it at um I can't. I can't remember. Sorry. Um, we see this. Oh, in, in the Gilgamesh epic, um, that when the gods, um, you know, they created humans for the purpose of of feeding themselves, to work the land, to feed them. And in the Gilgamesh epic, we read about how you know after the flood, the gods smelled the sweet savor of the sacrifice, and they crowded about the sacrificer like flies, um, as the way it's described. God. You know, in the Old Testament, Yahweh, when the people of Israel offer a sacrifice, you know, will talk about how God smells the sweet savor. It's not that he's really being fed, but he's receiving it in much the similar kind of way. And so they would place the cakes on the fire, it would burn, turn to smoke, and then that's kind of how it would then, um, then get to heaven. And so they're doing all this, and then very often, you know, you would pour a drink offering over the cake itself, you know, as it's burning as sort of a, you know, this this libation, um, lifting, in a sense, the, the sacrifice to heaven. And so, okay, so the people are doing all these things, and it says, in order to provoke me to anger, in verse 18, and then verse 19, are they provoking me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves instead to their own shame? So what they're doing, it's not really that it's just against Yahweh. It's it's even actually something against their, their themselves. God, you see, God doesn't want this undivided worship because he's just needy and in need of attention. Um, it's because, you know, the basic idea is that if you worship anything other than the true creator... You're, that's damnation on your own self. Um, so the people are, they're harming themselves by worshiping something that's not the true creator of, of everything. And so then in verse 20, therefore, this is what the Lord says, behold, my anger, my wrath will be poured out on this place, on human and animal life, and on the trees of the field, the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. So very strong pronouncement of judgment that's going to happen here um, because of this. So I wanted just to briefly explore that because chapter 44, we're going to see this worship of the Queen of Heaven coming back up again, um, that the people really haven't changed their ways, um, unfortunately, and that's happening in Egypt. Okay, so that concludes uh, this talk on Jeremiah 7.